Hi, this is Patrick from H2O, and I'm going to be showing some things about our uh, machine learning interpretability product. So right now, I'm signing in to H2O Driverless AI, and I've already uploaded a data set from Kaggle known as the uh, Taiwanese credit card data set. Some of you may already be familiar with it. It's a fairly well-known data set, also a fairly simple data set. Uh, we can have a look at some of the columns. So in this credit card data set, we have a row identifier, which we won't be using in our models. We have someone's credit limit, and the variable is called limit bow. We have someone's gender. We have their educational level. We have their marital status. We have their age. And we have uh, payment information. So if I scroll over a little bit, these pay zero through pay six variables are someone's most recent repayment status starting at pay zero, going back two months, three months, four months, five months, six months. These take values like minus two, meaning paid in full, minus one, meaning paid with another line of credit, zero, meaning no consumption, one, meaning one month late, two, meaning two months late, up to eight, nine months late. Similarly, we have bill amount one through bill amount six. And these are the same customer's credit card bills from the most recent month up to six months ago. And then we have their payment information, their most recent payment, and their payment up to six months ago, pay amount six. So that's the payment towards their bills. And we're trying to predict whether someone will default on their credit card bill next month using this information. Okay, so I'm going to quickly build a model. And the object of this video is not, not to focus on the model building aspect of the software, which is very detailed, and there could be a complete separate series of videos on that. Um, I'm just going to quickly build a predictive model using H2O driverless AI. I'm going to select the target. which is default payment next month. And I'm going to run the system on the default settings it suggests. Now, in terms of interpretability, there is an interpretability knob on this main screen. And it basically affects the complexity of the features that the system will consider. On the systems given here, given us a note here that it's not using the row identifier variable in the model, which is expected. So back to this interpretability knob. Essentially, the higher interpretability is, the simpler the features that this main modeling routine, which tries to do feature engineering on its own, the simpler the features it will try to extract or engineer from the data set. And if I turn interpretability up above a certain threshold, then the system will try to build a monotonically constrained model. Time basically refers to how many generations of a genetic algorithm I can wait for and, and other things that the system's doing. Right now it's doing some parameter tuning. Accuracy is essentially how complex are the underlying models that I use to try to select the features and how hard do we work to prevent overfitting. So if I turn accuracy way up, um, we'll build fairly complex underlying models and we'll work really, really hard to prevent overfitting. If I turn time way up, we'll run for a long time. We'll let the system try to engineer many, many different features. Uh, if I turn interpretability way up, we'll only use very simple features in our model and our model will be monotonically constrained. Okay, as this model's building, and here we can see it, just now uh, engineered its first feature, which looks like the addition of um, someone's credit limit and uh, numeric encoding of their most recent repayment status. Oh, not variable dropped out. Okay, while this model building process is continuing, I'm gonna quickly show some other resources that might be interesting. So first, uh, this is a booklet that we did in coordination with O'Reilly Media that gives a, um, 
a fairly well-rounded introduction to the topic of interpretable machine learning. And uh, it's, it's meant to be uh, readable for, for business decision makers and business analysts as well as data scientists. And you'll have to try a free trial of O'Reilly Safari or be a member of O'Reilly Safari to get this book for now. We recently published a white paper that we hope to be submitting to conferences uh, over the next few months. And this paper uses open source software as opposed to the driverless AI software, which is commercial and proprietary. This paper uses open source software to uh, prove out some of the explainability methods and uh, presents a in-depth use case using a white box classifier paired with explainability techniques to, to build a very transparent model using the same uh, the same credit card data and again it uses open source tools. Again on the open source side we have this repo of Python notebooks that in many ways was used to prototype the software you're going to see in just a few minutes uh, in H2O driverless AI and this is completely open source, uses open source tools and you can clone this repo, download the notebooks, do whatever you'd like uh, and, and I'd say the main difference, you know, with the open source tools is there won't be a nice linked GUI, which you'll see later in this video, and uh, it'll, it will be hard to deploy the results that you might find. And in, in the proprietary software, we do make a lot of the explainability results, important explainability results, deployable. And then finally, uh, this is a list that we keep of uh, many different types of interpretability software and books and papers. And if, if this topic is interesting to you, then, then this might be something you want to check out later. And again, this is just an ongoing sort of curated list of a lot of different explainability resources. And most of the resources on this list are meant to be either open source or free. Okay, uh, we can see that our model is almost done building. Uh, the system did extract some interesting features, it appears, and uh, our AUC did increase through the model building process, which is expected. So we started out with just the raw features, and then the system engineered features that increased the AUC. So once we're completely done here, the object is going to be to interpret this model that we just trained or explain this model that we just trained. Explain might be a better word. Okay, so I'm going to click that. And this just takes a few minutes. So in general, the calculations used to explain machine learning models can be fairly uh, computationally expensive, and that's what's going on now. It oftentimes involves um, scoring the model while manipulating every row and column of a data set, and so potentially scoring the model many, many, many times, and, and other uh, potentially time-consuming calculations. So that's what's happening right now, and when this finishes, we'll get into the details of, of those calculations and how you can, the results of which, how you can use them to explain your machine learning models that you train in driverless AI. Should be just a few more seconds. Okay, so MLI, machine learning interpretability. And as I've said several times, I think machine learning explainability might be a better word here, but we'll leave that subject for now. Okay, so after you've built a complex model, you'll have a summary of some basic facts about the model here, and then some information about variable importance. This is variable importance in the space of the derived features. And here we have variable importance in, in the space of the original features. And in general, we expect this to be a little bit harder to understand, and we expect these to be a little bit easier to understand. 
In the middle, you have information about surrogate models. And surrogate models are just one useful tool that are used to explain machine learning models. And surrogate models are simple models of complex models. And we'll, we'll come back to talk a little bit more in detail about these surrogate models. But I think what I'd like to point out on the summary page is we can see um, some basic information about the model that we just built and some basic information about the um, interpretability tools we just ran. Again, we can see this ranked variable importance in the derived feature space. And we can see ranked variable importance in the original feature space. And of course, we do expect some alignment between these. So I see pay zero, pay two, three, four, five, six, limit val all showing up very high. And so I can see pay zero, pay two, um, pay zero, pay amount one, pay amount six, pay zero, the original variable itself, um, pay zero used again, an interaction between pay zero and pay five. So um, we're seeing some alignment here, and I'd say this, this level of alignment is, is uh, fairly expected. And again, the idea is that I can use these uh, original variable importance, or the variable importance in the original feature space as sort of a tool to start reasoning through these more complex features. Okay, and we'll come back to the, all, the, all this information about surrogate models in just a minute. So the first thing I like to look into is uh, a very important new advance in explainable machine learning called Shapley values. And Shapley values have been around for quite some time, but uh, their application to machine learning is somewhat new. And, and their easy and widespread application to machine learning is very new. So this is the global Shapley feature importance. And you may have used feature importance in the past if you've used decision tree ensemble models. And you might immediately see what's different here is that Shapley importance is signed. So I can get um, not only a sense of which variables are important, but also in which direction do they uh, impact the model's predictions. And that's a, that's a new, um, a nice new advantage over you know typical random forest or gradient boosting machine or decision tree variable importance and, and for theoretical reasons this variable importance can actually be proven to be the only possible accurate and consistent variable importance and so this helps with the problem of you know if i do a random forest and i look at the Gini uh, variable importance and i look at the mean accuracy decrease variable importance it might rank the variables different. And if I change the data just a little bit, uh, the same model or very similar model might also rank the variables a little bit differently. And Shapley values help us get around that problem of inconsistent variable importance. So um, even if the data was changed a little bit, we would expect that the, the variable ranking to stay fairly similar using, using Shapley values. So this is a global feature importance, an accurate and consistent global feature importance. This tells us the derived features that are driving the model prediction from an overall perspective. And this is the first thing I like to look at. Now, as we've hinted at, these derived features can be a little bit tricky to understand. And this brings us to our surrogate models. And I think um, surrogate models are approximate and, and somewhat controversial but I, th I think their, their main benefit, and a lot of people overlook this, is being able to tell us about a very complex system in the space of the original inputs. And that's exactly what I'm going to do now. So I'm going to look at the feature importance of our model, an approximate feature importance of our model in the original feature space. So I can see pay zero, pay two, pay three, five, four, limit balance, pay six. So this is a little bit simpler to understand. And these are the main drivers of the model in the original feature space. Now, how is this calculated? So we have to go back to our summary page. So the way that this is calculated is we build a random forest between the original inputs and the predictions of the complex driverless AI model that was just trained. 
And it's important to know how accurate that model is. And we can see that, that the uh, mean squared error is very low and the R squared is very high. So we would say that this is a fairly trustworthy model between the inputs, the original inputs to the system and the predictions of the system. So this is a simple model, a single random forest model of the very complex driverless AI model. And we can look at the feature importance like we were just doing of this random forest model to get a good sense of what are the main drivers of the model in the original feature space. So now, to summarize, we've looked at the main drivers of the model in the derived feature space. We've looked at the main drivers of the model in the original feature space. And the next thing I like to do is look at the overall global behavior of the variables, the original variables with respect to the model. So pay zero, very important variable. We see it showing up. Um, we see pay zero, pay two, and, and I'm gonna pick limit val to, to make an example of. We see pay zero, pay two, limit val showing up as very important original variables. Uh, we see them, we see them showing up, you know, here in a, in a combined variable that looks to be the most important variable. And if we click around, we will probably also start to see limit val showing up somewhere in these uh, derived features. And it's probably just not doing it because I'm recording this video. But uh, we, limit val is, is somewhat of an important feature and I just picked it as an example because it's numeric, which the other variables are categorical. So um, we can see that pay zero, pay two, very important for the derived features very important in the original feature space. And then again, I'm gonna highlight limit balance, mainly because it's a numeric variable that's also somewhat important. Okay, so we've summarized the sort of global, overall, important derived and original features in the model. Now I wanna see their behavior, their global behavior with respect to the model. So I'm gonna click on partial dependence. And so this is the partial dependence of pay zero. What does that mean? Well. Partial dependence is the average behavior of the model with respect to the values of any one variable. Or an easier way to say it might be the average prediction of the model with respect to the values of any one variable. So these are these good values of um, pay zero. This basically means the person paid on time or didn't use their credit card. And this means the person was one month late. Now we see a big jump in predicted probability of default at pay equals pay zero equals two, and then that probability of default kind of decreases out to pay zero equals eight. So what this tells us is globally or overall in the entire data set, the worst thing for a person to be in terms of defaulting with respect to pay two, I mean with pay zero, is to be two months late. Now, this software and other explanatory software does not tell you that that's right. It just exposes this behavior and then you as the user have more insight than you would have had before, and you can judge whether you should trust this model. Now that the tool has given you understanding of the model mechanisms, do you trust it? So, and I would say it's somewhat questionable that, that being two months late is somehow worse than being eight months late on your bill, on your credit card bill. Uh, there's, re there's potential reasons for this. You know, maybe there's very few of these people in the data set. Maybe these people have an arrangement with the bank. Um, but if I was a credit analyst, I'd be really interested in understanding what's going on here. So again, partial dependence, average prediction of the model with respect to the values of some variable. And uh, we typically want to investigate partial dependence for several important variables. Now, interestingly, we see the same pattern with the important variable pay two. So these are these good values. The person uh, didn't use their card or paid their bill on time. One month late, not much worse. And then a, a jump up two months late. So someone who is two months late on their credit card bill, uh, someone whose second most recent payment is two months late, their average predicted probability of default is 0 0.385. And let's just have a look at that. Um, limit balance variable since it's numeric, just because we're gonna get a slightly different picture. So we can see, and, and this is expected, and, and if, if you're really into credit scoring, you, you might be shaking your head, 
because uh, you typically would not include credit limit in, in a credit scoring model. That, that might be cause target leakage because credit limit is one way that, that people price in risk for credit customers. But we do see the expected behavior here that as someone's credit limit um, increases, they become slightly less likely to default. So down here at the lowest possible credit limit, uh, we have about uh, 0.27 probability of defaulting on average. For the highest credit limit, uh, we have about 0.204 probability of default on average. Now, what are the, what's this gray? This gray is the standard deviation of the partial dependence. And that's useful because you know, if the standard deviation is very wide, that tells us that this average line is not very trustworthy. But, but here we can see the standard deviation sort of follows the, the average behavior and, and is narrow enough in this case to be trustworthy, especially since it's um, sort of parsimonious with our, our business intuition here. And we'll, we'll come back and we'll have a look at this um, standard deviation of the partial dependence also later. Okay, so again to summarize, we've looked at the main drivers of the model in the derived feature space, the main drivers of the model in the original feature space. We investigated how those original, some of those original important variables, um, how the model behaves with respect to their values. So we, you know, if, if you were to spend some time here and dig into all these different variable importances and the partial dependence plots, you would get a really good feel for how single variables are behaving. And, and that's important. But what's also important is to consider um, interactions because we know that one thing that, that, that sets machine learning models apart from more uh, established or traditional linear modeling methods is interactions. So, so how can we start gaining some insights into interactions? And there's two ways in this system and we'll talk about the simplest one first. So this is another surrogate model. And, and let's, we can see here that the RMSE is fairly low and that the R squared again is fairly high. So I'd, I'd say that this is a, at least a somewhat trustworthy surrogate model. And since it's a single decision tree, what it really provides us is an approximate overall flow chart of the complex model's behavior. And from that flow chart, we can see things that are high up in the flow chart. Those would be important variables. So we're seeing again, pay zero, pay two, pay three, all these repayment status variables, uh, sort of echoing things that we've seen in, in previous plots that, that tell us that these are the most important variables. Now, to get into the interactions, basically we say there's a potential interaction when a variable is a, you know, below another variable in the decision tree. So here's that pay zero, pay two interaction. And if we go back to our uh, Shapley values, right, Here's that, here's a pay zero, pay two interaction being one of the most important variables. So I think this is fairly confirmatory that there's some strong interaction that our, our complex black box model picked up on uh, between pay zero and pay two. Okay, now um, the this thickness of this line here indicates that this is the most common path through the decision tree. And that's good because this is the lowest probability of default leaf node. So that, that sort of is again aligned with, with our business intuition here because uh, the credit card companies would go out, of bill, go out of business if most people weren't paying their bills. So, so most people are paying their bills and ended up ending up in a really low probability of default uh, bucket. And we can, we can learn exactly uh, how this decision tree places people in this bucket. And that's an approximation to how the complex model would place people in this bucket. So um, basically, basically, you pay your first payment on time, your most recent, and I keep mixing that up, you pay your most recent uh, payment on time. Minus one, minus two, zero, and missing go this way. Now we can't really talk about missing in the partial dependence plot, but if we go back and look at uh, pay zero, Minus one, minus two, zero, one. These are all these low values of predicted default. And I can go back and see sort of that confirmed that, and it's not that we're saying that behavior is right, but we're confirming that is how the model is behaving. And it's up to you as the credit analyst to decide if that's correct or not. So uh, 
these good values of pay zero puts you down this side of the tree. Uh, again, for pay two, these lower values that we saw in the partial dependence plot. Over here, we saw that these are lower probability of default values. That also moves you through the decision tree in a way that, that's favorable in terms of your um, not defaulting. And again, we're not saying that's correct, but we're saying we're kind of confirming that's how the model is behaving and you as the analyst get to decide if that's correct. Now to end up in this lowest probability of bucket, um, your most recent bill amount needed to be greater than or equal to 21.6850 Taiwanese dollars or missing. So um, you, you needed to do well on your most recent payment, your second most recent payment, and have a fairly large bill uh, in, in your most recent bill. That's how you would end up in the lowest probability of default bucket. To end up in the highest probability of default bucket, let's see how you would get there. Well, basically, you, you miss your first payment. Um, you can make your, you can, you can have not used your, um, your card during your third most recent payment, or you could be late up to six months, or the information could be missing. So, so almost anything could happen for your third most recent payment except you paying it off completely. And then um, your fifth most recent payment, you're basically late on. And, and that's how you would end up here. So the way I read this is um, I have bad recent repayment behavior and I have bad um, repayment behavior from five months ago. And that is how the model decides, oh, this person's never going to pay their bill. And, and that's somewhat aligned with my kind of naive business intuition. I think if I was a credit analyst, I'd be interested to understand what's going on with this, you know, uh, how come someone who, who pays, who doesn't use their card in their third most recent repayment, how come they're going down this bad direction? And uh, there may be some domain expertise insight there, there may be something in the data, or that could just be something that the model is doing wrong and that you would need to go back and try to fix somehow and retrain the model. So um, I'm gonna to continue to summarize. We've, we've investigated the, the most important variables in the derived feature space, the original feature space. Uh, we've looked at their average behavior with respect to the model prediction by examining the partial dependence. Uh, and then we wanted to look at how the variables are interacting or start to look at how the variables are interacting. And that's what we use this surrogate decision tree for. And again, the surrogate decision tree is a single decision tree model uh, where the inputs to the single decision tree are the, are the inputs to the system and what the decision tree tries to model are the predictions of the complex driverless AI model. Uh, these graphics are downloadable, so you can put them in your PowerPoint presentation or your Word doc or your LaTeX doc. Uh, and that's just a little thing I'd, I've been meaning to point out. So most of, the, most of the graphics that you see in this dashboard are downloadable just as, as static images. So moving on, now that we have a pretty good um, understanding for how the model works on a global basis, you know, for, for the entire data set and, and for, for uh, you know, overall, we want to start investigating how it works uh, for a single person. And, and that's really where a lot of the innovations and explainable machine learning have happened recently. So uh, I'm going to go click on K-Lime. And K-Lime is, is pretty complex, um, probably most useful to, to advanced users, but um, it's, it's the easiest way to, to select one person. Now I can always just type in a person's row index up here. But this plot is, is kind of an interesting way to select a person too. Now, as I mentioned, the, the plot is kind of complex and this is how I like to handle it. So I'm gonna make everything on the plot disappear. Okay. Uh, now I'm gonna start by adding back in model prediction. So what is that? This is the predictions of the driverless AI model from lowest to highest. And the x-axis is simply whatever index of the rows 
causes that ranking to occur from lowest to highest. So everything that you're gonna see on this plot is ranked from lowest prediction by the driverless AI model on the left to highest prediction of the driverless AI model on the right. Now I'm gonna add back in the goods and the bads. So these people did not pay their bills up top and these people at the bottom uh, did pay their bills. And so this can be a good common sense check because down here where most people uh, are paying their bills and very few people aren't, the model probabilities are low. Over here where people aren't paying their bills and people, uh, people have, have stopped paying their bills and more people have started defaulting, the model probability is high. So this is kind of a basic common sense check of the model. It, it doesn't tell you that much besides the model's not completely wrong. Now let's add in back in those white dots. What in the world are these white dots? Again, this is another surrogate model, and we can see how accurate it is here. Uh, R squared of 0.8962, and since this is a linear model, the R squared has its um, traditional uh, interpretation, which is this linear model explains 89.62% of the variance in the driverless AI model. So that alone is informative. Um, a linear model explains about 90% of the variance in this driverless AI model. So the driverless AI model is fairly linear. Um, and again, we use these error metrics to decide how trustworthy is this surrogate model. And in this case, since R squared is high, RMSE is low, I'd say that this surrogate model is useful enough to, to, to proceed. And this Again, to, to reemphasize, this is a single linear model trained on the original inputs of the system to predict the predictions of the driverless AI model. Now, this is an implementation of the process called LIME, Local Interpretable Model Agnostic Explanations. And um, we'll, we'll dig into, into LIME a little bit more. But the basic idea with LIME is what you're seeing on the screen use linear models to help reason about, uh, use linear surrogate models to help reason about the predictions of a, of a complex model. Now, if I was a credit analyst, uh, I'd probably be really interested in one of these high probability of default people. So I'm just gonna click on one. And like I said, I, I feel like Lime and, and K-Lime as it's implemented here are, are most useful to, to sort of um, the, the most technical audiences of this software. So I'm, I'm gonna move away from Lime and, and come back to it in just a minute. I wanna go back to Shapley. Okay, so what we see here in gray are the local Shapley values. So this tells us, in fact, the exact contribution of each of these variables, the exact numeric contribution of the variable to the predict to this one high probability of default person. Okay. So it, it takes a second for the impact of this to set in, but it, but it's hugely impactful. We can now, and, and anyone who can use Shapley explanations, who can use this software, use XGBoost, or use LightGBM or, or the Shap Python package, can now generate for every single prediction a nonlinear machine learning model makes, can generate accurate variable contribution values for every single row that the model predicts on. So if I was to pick a different row, these gray bars would change. The green bars would say the same because that's the global, and we just think it's convenient to sometimes compare the global uh, Shapley importance to the local Shapley importance for any one given row. But the key here is these gray bars are the exact numeric contribution of each variable to each prediction of the model. And so these values can be used to generate what are called reason codes, um, meaning that in many countries, if, if I use a model to make a, a credit lending decision and I reject someone, I have to tell them why. And these are very regulated uh, decision-making systems, and we are very confident that these Shapley values could actually be used to make reason codes even in strict regulatory uh, regimes. So, and the way we would do that is we just basically look for what are the largest contributors here to the, to the decision. So what are the largest gray bars? So pay zero, right? So 
locally, and I think this goes back to the surrogate decision tree, locally, pay zero is pushing this person up towards defaulting a lot. And it, it's not the most, it's this interaction between pay zero and pay two. I'll, I'll, I'll come to that. But, but let's consider pay zero because it's probably easier to reason about. So pay zero uh, is, is someone's most recent repayment status. And we saw in the surrogate decision tree that overall, most people are paying their bills and most people are going this way through the tree. Most people are making their most recent payment. So that's probably why when we look at Shapley, globally, pay zero has this minor negative value. So we're saying globally, pay zero is pushing the model down, the model outcome down away from defaulting. But locally, for this very high probability of default person, um, they are being moved up by a point, about 0.38 uh, points in the, in the linear space before a logit is applied. So, so moving this person up towards defaulting, whereas globally, for everyone, it moves people down. And I think, again, we saw that reflected in the surrogate decision tree because most people paid their bills. And again, we can use the surrogate decision tree to see this person, now they're highlighted in gray. And I can see how they move through the tree. So very likely, this person was two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight months late on their second, on their most recent payment. And, and that is reflected in the Shapley value. Now, un, these values are both consistent and locally accurate. So consistent is more important on the global level. And that kind of means if the data changes a little bit or the model changes a little bit, we don't expect the variable importance to be completely reshuffled. On the local level, what this means, since they're locally accurate, if I added up these gray bars plus the average prediction of the model and applied an inverse logit function, I would get the exact numeric prediction of the model because this is a classification problem. If it was a regression problem, I would get the exact prediction just by summing up the values that these gray bars represent. But in either case, a very simple transformation allows me to sum up all of these variable contributions to the exact prediction of the model for every prediction that the model makes. And moreover, these values are locally accurate, that's what I was just saying, and globally consistent and very likely suitable for making reason codes even under strict regulatory regimes. So this is a huge breakthrough in explainable machine learning. And I want to emphasize it has nothing to do with surrogate models. Uh, Shapley values operate on the data set, I'm, I'm sorry, on the trained model itself. That's why the Shapley values are in the space of the derived features. So uh, just, just a huge breakthrough in, in explainable machine learning. Not approximate like the surrogate model techniques at all. Uh, exact, consistent, local variable contributions that can change for every single row of the data set and that always add up to the model the prediction for each row. And, and again, I think it takes some time for this to sink in, but it's just a huge advance in, in explainable machine learning. Okay, so I'll stop harping on Shapley values. And uh, I think I'll have a look at this dashboard. I'll zoom out a little bit. So I said there are there two things that helped us find um, interactions, and, and they're available on this dashboard. And I think, uh, you know, before this video ends, I'll go back and hit K-Lime, uh, and I'll, I want to talk about using these two plots together to, to sort of confirm interactions. Okay. So it's convenient. You know, I click dashboard, which allows me to see some of these plots at the same time. And, and that's convenient, especially down here with the surrogate decision tree. Now this person, the person at row 8177, the way they're moving through the tree is highlighted in gray. And there's a very high probability of default person. If I, if I click kind of a, a less high probability of default person, See, we can see they move through the tree a little bit differently. 
So that's kind of convenient. And then we can see there are approx this, these are not Shapley values. This is an approximate local variable importance in gray, which is also useful. Um, we can see that here at the same time too. So we can see that pay two, whatever is going on with pay two for this person is, is really driving the prediction. And if I come down and look at the surrogate decision tree, that makes a lot of sense because if they had had a different value for pay two, they would have gone into one of those real uh, low probability of default buckets, but they had, um, a, they missed their most second most recent payment and that sent them a different direction. So I think that makes a lot of sense that we're seeing pay two being the, the most important uh, variable locally for this person. Now again, uh, I'm trying to find an, an interaction and I might just have to, I might just have to talk about it sort of theoretically. Yeah, it looks like in this in this region of the response function, there's not much interaction happening. Let me just try a different one. And again, I think this is kind of reflecting the fact that we, we trained a fairly linear model. Okay, I think I'm just going to have to discuss uh, what a strong interaction would look like on this dashboard in just kind of a, a what-if manner. Okay, so these white dots on this partial dependence plot are called ICE, Individual Conditional Expectation. And whereas partial dependence is the average output of the model across the values of a variable, ICE is simply the, the prediction of the model for this person, row 7752, cycled through. We, we take their row of data and we fix everything except pay two and we cycled them through different values of pay two and we see what happens. And um, if these ICE values, if this ICE curve sort of significantly or obviously diverges, and when I say significantly, I don't mean in a statistical way, let's say obviously, when, when this uh, ice curve obviously diverges from the partial dependence, you know, and, and what we would see is partial dependence going down, but ice kind of shooting up. And, and here we see partial dependence going down and ice kind of staying high. So maybe that's indicative of, a, of an interaction. And what we would do is, okay, so pay two, maybe let's have a look at pay zero. Okay, maybe, maybe there's a little bit more evidence of an interaction here. See, we see partial dependence sort of going down and we see uh, ice staying high. And that, that can be indicative of an interaction too because we're seeing the individual behavior being different from the average behavior. Interactions can get averaged out of the prediction of a model over an entire data set. So pay zero, we can say, we can see, you know, there's some interaction going on here, potentially between pay zero, pay three, pay five for this person to end up in this fairly high probability of default bucket. And uh, so I would say that, that these two tools in concert really help us get, get more information about interactions between the original variables. So, so since ICE is diverging here when um, for two and above, uh, I think it, it's potentially fair to say that that's what we're seeing. Uh, we're seeing this interaction between pay zero and pay three uh, have, have some effect here, or potentially the interaction um, with pay five lower down the tree. So these two plots, when ICE diverges from partial dependence, and when we see a variable below one, another variable in the decision tree, if we, see a strong, if we see a strong divergence here, we can go back and try to trace that through the tree and learn more about interactions. Now, as I've said, unfortunately, uh, the model we've trained appears to be fairly linear and, and I'm not seeing any particularly strong interactions and I'm just talking through how that, how that scenario would play out. Um, and, and I do, uh, in this paper, have an example of that just to give you a real example since I droned on about it for so long. Okay. So here we can see um, the thick red line is the partial dependence, kind of a, a x squared shape. And, and we know, in fact, this is simulated data and this is x squared. 
uh, it, it's supposed to look like this. And then we can see for some rows, this yellow and orange, these yellow and orange ice curves, it does not have that same uh, x squared type behavior. And I can go up and, and look at a surrogate decision tree. Now, this plot is for num9. This partial dependence in ice plot is for num9. I can see that for num9, between about um, less than 1 and greater than, you know, let's say, minus 1, there's some interactions occurring, num9, num8, num8, num9, num4. And so if I go down and look at this plot, roughly between minus 1 and 1, I can see that, that there are some interactions taking place. So I would say this is fairly confirmatory in this case uh, of, of interactions taking place. And again, this is a different data set, a simulated data set, uh, where we know that this is the signal generating function and we can see there is an interaction between num8 and num9, and num9 does have that square behavior. So sorry for this little detour, but I just wanted to be clear about um, how to use surrogate decision trees and individual conditional expectation and partial dependence together to help suss out uh, potential interactions. Okay, so two more things to talk about. Lime, and then I wanna talk about some advanced settings. So, LIME stands for Local Interpretable Model Agnostic Explanations and is very often implemented as linear model, uh, lo local linear surrogate models of complex machine learning models. And, and that's what's done here. Um, we build several clusters in the data set. In this case, it looks like we built 15 clusters. Then in each of those clusters, we fit a local linear surrogate model. So again, I'm just going to pick one of these high probability of default people and I zoom in to the k-means cluster in which they exist. Now one thing I'd like to point out is I don't think that k-means is the greatest segmentation process in the world and you in, in the advanced setting section I'm about to show, uh, you can supply your own segments to the system and we'll fit local linear models in each of your segments and I think that's probably better in most cases. But anyway, we've, we've picked a point and we've zoomed into their local cluster. And now, um, let's see, our R squared is 89% here in cluster 12. Uh, globally, it's still about 89% because this is a fairly linear model. If it was a more nonlinear model, we would expect that, that zooming into a local region, a local area of the response function, uh, would, would make the local area of the response function appear more linear and a local linear model would have a better fit. But regardless, the idea is that I use these local linear model predictions, the white dots, to reason about the driverless AI model, the green line, in some local region. So if I pick a point, I can get more information. And the first thing I like to look at is, um, so, so this person did actually default. Uh, driverless AI gave them a, a 0.71 probability of default. Lime gives them a 0.73 probability of default. And so in this case, we say Lime is about 97% accurate. So I'd say that the, these local variable importances that, that I'm showing below and that we're calling reason codes are fairly trustworthy in this case. Uh, I'd say if this, if this dips below 75%, then, then these numbers are, could, could be untrustworthy, and we do show a warning to go look at Shapley in that case. So another thing I like to point out here is that it's, linear models are nice because we know how to interpret them. We can, we can make these nice little sentences like I'll show in just a minute. But um, if, if the linear model fails, which it will certainly fail sometimes, it doesn't matter. That's telling you that the driverless AI model is very nonlinear in the local region, which is good information to know. And just go look at the Shapley values, which are, which are guaranteed to be accurate. So you would make your reason codes from the Shapley value in the case that your local linear model was not very accurate, which can happen. And again, I don't see that as, as a problem. I see that as informative. It just means that the, the model is very nonlinear in that local region. But what else do we have on this page? So um, I can see, and because this is a linear model, we can do this nice little trick. 
pay zero, this person was three months late, and that's associated with an increase of about 0.24 probability points according to this linear model. And what is this 0.24? Well, the 0.24 is the local linear model coefficient for, um, in this case, because pay zero is a categorical variable, it's just the local linear model coefficient for pay zero equals to three. For bill amount three, because it's numeric, this number would represent the local linear model regression coefficient times this value 100,000 100,256 Taiwanese dollars. So these are uh, beta j times xij local variable contributions derived from a local linear model. Now, if we go down here to the, to the cluster reason codes, these are just the coefficients for the local linear model. And I think that, that even if Lyme is approximate, uh, and, and we're really getting into some kind of advanced subtle things here, but um, I would use Shapley values as the, as the accurate point estimate of my, of my local variable contribution. But the Lyme values, even though they're approximate, are still interesting because they tell me the trend around that point estimate. So I think for an advanced sort of senior data scientist perspective here, I would use Shapley values as my local point estimate for local variable importance. And then I would use Lyme as an approximate estimate of the trend, how the model is behaving around that, that point estimate in that local region. So um, again, Lyme is approximate. It's not perfect, but since it uses linear models, we can do not, lots of nice things like automatically make these little sentences. Uh, that tell us about the, the local feature importance as approximated by a linear model. We can see trends in the local region. And we can see trends globally. So uh, we always train one global linear model so that we can see these trends globally. And I think that's another uh, nice benefit of Lyme is, is seeing uh, approximate trends from your complex model at different scales. So globally in a cluster, for one point. Okay, I think the last thing I'll show in this video is uh, a new, our new interpretation screen. And, and this is where a lot of the advanced functionality for the dashboard would be available and the ability to interpret uh, an external model. So I can load a data set here, you know, SAS model, R model, Weka model, whatever, it doesn't matter. A FICO model, I can load in the inputs, the label, and the prediction. I can just upload that into the system and we will build the dashboard that I just explained. Now we can't do the Shapley values, but we can do all of the, the uh, techniques that are based on the surrogate models. So I think that's a really interesting feature of the software is we can use it to explain external uh, models if, if the model can be represented as inputs, a target, and predictions towards that target. And um, just to show some of the advanced features that are available here. Um, okay, so we, we can do Lyme, K-Lyme. We can find the local, um, local regions using K-means clustering. Or we can find the local regions using a decision tree, which that's interesting because then we can see uh, exactly how someone falls into a local region. Let's see. Go back to K-Lime. Now, here is where you could upload your own clustering column. So if you, if you or your company had segments that you trust really well, uh, then you could just use them and we would build the local linear surrogate model in your clusters, the local linear surrogate, mo local linear surrogate models in your clusters. I think that's really important. Um, we can do weighting. So uh, if, you, if you have an imbalance problem or, or another condition where you'd like to provide observation weights, we can use those in, in our local linear model training. Uh, one thing that can help the accuracy or fidelity of Lyme is to do binning of the inputs. That's an old trick with linear models is, is to use bins. I can take a numeric column, bin it, and then I essentially get more parameters for that column and, and a more flexible model. 
Uh, this, this setting would allow you to grow that surrogate decision tree out deeper, which, which I certainly think is important if, if you really want to um, get into the details. And that, so again, this doesn't really, um, if I'm doing K-Lime, this, this is just a separate setting that grows the decision tree out deeper. If I switch to uh, Lime Soup, which, which uses a decision tree to find the local segments, then uh, in each node of the tree and, and the depth of the tree would obviously affect that number, that's where I'm going to fit my local linear surrogate models. Um, by default, we do some pretty serious sampling to make the dashboard populate faster. Uh, if you'd like to turn that off, you can click that button. Uh, you can drop columns from, from the analysis if you need to. And then um, another, uh, another thing that's really important with all these surrogate models that we're training is to know if they're stable. And so we do offer the ability to, to cross-validate the, the surrogate models uh, so you can get a sense of, of their stability across different folds of, of the data that you're analyzing. So, of course, the, the best kind of surrogate model is, a, is an accurate and stable surrogate model. We don't do the cross-validation by default because it takes a lot of time. Okay, so with that, um, that's a fairly uh, detailed tour through the software. And, and I'll, I'll stop here. There's a couple little things I left off, but, but this will definitely get you started. Hope that was informative.